everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. It finally felt like fall in Oklahoma this week, which made us want to hit the road to the pumpkin patch and corn maze. School children love taking field trips to Pea Bar Farms, a centennial farm near Hydro. We have a flour mill here on the farm and when we ask kids where, kids where flour comes from, uh, the number one answer we get is from flowers. And so uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to show them and put hands on to that and realize that the food comes from a farm somewhere here in Oklahoma. We'll have more from Pea Bar Farms a little bit later in the show. But first, we're covering the topic of fall armyworms. Here's Sun Up's Dave Deacon and our extension entomologist, Tom Royer. Even though it's October, we're still seeing armyworms across Oklahoma. And, and Tom, you're getting reports of them out in the wheat field. Yes. I uh, particularly I wrote a, a quick news article yesterday because and put it posted it up because um, a consultant from Wheeler Brothers had gone out to a field and looked at it and advised the producer to treat because he saw uh, that threshold had been reached and he was finding evidence of the the feeding the window painting and everything just like we always talk about. He took a picture of that field, took it back to his office and started looking at the computer and he started circling all the caterpillars he didn't see when he was out in the field looking because they're so small and they're hiding so well and went from three to 15 because they're just so tiny. And the point is if you're seeing evidence of injury and you're seeing uh, you, you have a, even the threshold, you're probably not seeing everything that's out there. And I, right now the questions I'm getting, should I treat, should I not treat, I think if you treat we have fairly inexpensive products that can get good control of them. We have adequate moisture, we have uh, good foliage. And right now that's gonna give a producer options. Um, if they wanna grow for grain, if they wanna use for grazing grain, uh, grazing and grain, mm -hmm. or they just wanna graze out, it gives them more options than letting the fall armyworms have that crop and then having it try to recover between now and uh, when it, it goes into winter dormancy. So from my standpoint, uh, it just gives the producer options uh, that, uh, and who knows you know, what prices are gonna do in the future. I guess you'd have to ask Kim Anderson that, but uh, um, at least gives them options. Now, we, we, we've had a couple of cool nights, but mm -hmm. the army worms are still gonna be around until when? They are gonna be around until we get a killing frost. The nice thing is, is that we're getting closer to that time uh, in, in terms of getting rid of them, but also it slows them down. So we're probably not going to see the heavy flights that we've typically been seeing up until now. They'll, they'll be slowing down and they grow a little slower and everything. So things should be calming down a little bit. But I do know that there's a lot of wheat that's just coming up out of the ground and it has to be protected. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk just briefly about some options whenever it does come to treating for those. Well, the, the first is obviously to get out and look at that field and catch them early. Uh, when you start seeing that window painting, take a good count. Um, the insecticides that are registered, there's a, a, a slew of them really. They work pretty well. Uh, a lot of them are fairly inexpensive, but the key is is to catch them when the, the fall armyworms are small because they're a lot more susceptible to insecticide um, killing them than they are when they get bigger. Plus they aren't gonna take as much of the foliage out of the field too. Okay, thank you much, Tom. And we'll put a link to that report on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. The new supply and demand report is out, but before we get to that, let's talk about where the markets were before it was released, Kim. Well, the markets were mostly in the tank. You look at corn and let's look at the Chicago uh, December contract. It was down to 344. That is, you know, it's been moving 
trading between 344 and about uh, 360, 370. It's right on the bottom. It's right on the support level before that market, that report came out. Soybeans were at 966. Uh, they've got support down around 950. Uh, resistance up around 987 so they're in about the middle of their range and you know we've seen slightly higher soybean prices where wheat and uh, corn's been going down over the last couple weeks uh, the uh, KC uh, December wheat contract four dollars and 24 cents it's just been just working its way down just just really grinding down slowly uh, it's almost about ready to hit that four dollars and 20 cents that's the contract low if we break 420 on that wheat uh, well, we're already in trouble. We're just going to be in more trouble. The report, of course, was released on Thursday. What were the big takeaways? Well, let's look at ending stocks. Uh, for uh, wheat on the United States, the market was expecting 946 million bushels. They got 960, so, you know, higher than expected. You look at the world ending stocks, uh, they were at nine, expecting 9,660,000,000. It came in at a record 9,850,000,000, higher than last year. Finally, you know what? You, know, you go back a couple of months, we were down at 9.2 billion for world ending stocks. Corn, the market was expecting 2,290,000,000 bushels. It came in at 2.34 billion, slightly higher than expected. If you look at world ending stocks, just about near ex expectations. They were at 7.95 billion bushels. It came in at 7.91. Uh, soybeans, the only good news in the market, uh, the market was expecting 447 million for U.S. It came in at 430. And the world, they were expecting 3.54, and they essentially got that. And what do you think the market is, the reaction is going to be as a result? Well, soybeans will probably keep uh, moving up just a little bit. I think that's the good news in the market. You might as well start with that. We'll have to see if, if wheat uh, breaks that 420. There's, there's just really nothing out there for higher wheat prices. And, you know, they raid, raised Russian wheat production to over 3 billion bushels. You know, you go back three years and they're below 2 billion bushels. They, they're marketing, readily marketing 12.5% protein hard wheat. Can you look at corn? Uh, high corn stocks, uh, near record uh, corn production, second highest ever. Uh, we're not going to be able to move any of this wheat out for feed, so it's not going to help. Uh, it's going to hurt more uh, on the wheat prices, corn prices, not much hope there. Soybean, that's the only place that the market can move up. And speaking of grain prices, you're, you and the team are going to talk about that and a lot more at the upcoming economic conference next week. Give us uh, a little preview. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Daryl Pill and myself and, and uh, Larry Sanders will be talking about policy and, and the Oklahoma markets and Oklahoma agriculture. Then we've got some uh, national renowned economists coming in. I think the one thing that's going to come out would be interest rates. You know, that's kind of a sleeper over the last couple of years, but I think interest rates may be ready to go up and that'll, that'll definitely have an impact on agriculture. If you're interested, the Rural Economic Outlook Conference is always a great event. It's Friday, October 20th at the Conoco Phillips Alumni Center on the OSU campus. To learn more or for registration information, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. It has been a week of transitions, summer to fall, and the removal of a longtime mesonet site. Monday afternoon at 420, Oklahoma air temperatures range from 40 degrees at Boise City in the Panhandle to 94 degrees at Idabel in the southeast. That's a change of 54 degrees across the state. This mesonet map shows the sweeping away of summer and the entry of fall. Tuesday morning lows came in at 30 degrees at Kenton and Boys City. Only six mesonet sites made it to 50 or above. Most locations were in the mid-40s in central Oklahoma, except El Reno with its low of 35 degrees. Wednesday morning was cooler across the central part of the state, with many mesonet sites in the 30s or low 40s. Only one site, Eva at 30 degrees, had a morning low below freezing. El Reno was noticeably cooler than surrounding sites with a low of 33 degrees. Wednesday morning, the Ninicaw Mesonet site was retired. It had been collecting data since January 1, 1994. If you were using Ninicaw, switch over to the Chickasha Mesonet site. The Chickasha site is five miles to the north. Here's Gary with a look at our drought impact from our recent rainfall. 
Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, now, last week I did promise you a much better looking drought monitor map, and that's what we got. It's not perfect, and I'll show you why in a moment, but let's go right now and take a look. So we did see a large reduction in the abnormally dry and moderate drought that was splashed across much of northern uh, Oklahoma, especially northeast Oklahoma. Um, unfortunately, we did have to increase that D1 moderate drought, that's the light tan area uh, down in southeast Oklahoma, just a little bit, uh, but that's our stronghold of drought right now, the southeast and up into northeastern and east central Oklahoma. Um, if we look at the 10-day rainfall map, um, and of course this was from Wednesday back, we do see a large portion of the state had received uh, from two to four inches, and of course that area up in north central and northeast Oklahoma saw a large amount of rainfall, uh, very heavy rainfall, from four to as much as eight inches of rain, um, and of course that will wipe out drought in a hurry. Uh, but we do see those lighter blues and lighter greens down across the southern and southeastern portion of the state, and even some par portions of northwestern Oklahoma where the help was not quite as much as what was needed, and that's where we see the remnants of the abnormally dry conditions and also the moderate drought. So if we look at the departure from normal rainfall map from the Mesnet, this is for the 30 days from September 11th through October 10th. Again, we see where those areas, that stronghold down in southeastern Oklahoma, uh, where the deficits are still from three to four inches, a little bit of deficit up in north central and northeastern Oklahoma, uh, also across over there in east central Oklahoma, that's where that abnormally dry and moderate drought do persist. And we can go back even farther and see those areas more pronounced um, just a little bit. Uh, so it, it is a battle between the, uh, the shorter term 30 day deficits and the uh, longer term 60 day deficits. But again, across northern Oklahoma, down into east central and especially southeast Oklahoma. So that is the area down in southeast Oklahoma where we see the largest deficits uh, and also the most amount of moderate drought. Now it does look like we're into an extended period of dry weather again, but at least it's been a little bit cooler. So hopefully we won't see a rapid enhancement of drought and uh, get some rain in here eventually and uh, start wiping out drought like we did across northern Oklahoma. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Now to another classroom lesson with Brian Arnell. This week he's teaching us what phosphorus does to fields. Of our macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, phosphorus is typically our second most deficient nutrient in the state of Oklahoma. And as I talk about managing phosphorus, sometimes I get beyond some of the basics of what phosphorus does and why it's important in the plant and how we manage it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about phosphorus. Uh, many would say the phosphorus is the, the powerhouse of the plant. If you want to call it a superhero, it's that energy superhero, the, the, the thing that provides energy and allows the plant to have energy. Now we'll put phosphorus in the soil that, that is very available and very soluble and very mobile. But as soon as we get it into that soil system, we start having forms of phosphate like H2PO4 and HPO4, which are very chemically reactive. And so we always talk about phosphorus being immobile. It's not because it's binding to the soil and can't move. It's because if there's any cation in the system, so cation is a positively charged ion. If there's any cation in the system like a calcium, magnesium, iron, or aluminum, we're going to find phosphorus binding with those and creating compounds that become more and more insoluble. Now, where it binds, whether it binds to a calcium or an iron, is going to be based upon the soil pH. In a pH at seven or above, it's going to focus on, it's going to concentrate on the calciums in the system by binding with calciums, creating calcium phosphates. In our acidic soils, those soils that fall below a six, we're really going to be binding with irons and aluminums, creating iron phosphates and aluminum phosphates. What we apply in the soil as a fertilizer will turn into rock phosphate. 
So that's why we say phosphorus is, is most mobile when we first apply it because it's in a form that has less, the least amount of chemical bonds to it and it can move. So we apply phosphorus and it moves. And then for just a little bit, that first strain, and then it starts binding immediately with the calciums and irons and aluminums, becoming things that are minerals and not, no longer plant available. Now, if you want to know more about phosphorus, you can join in and watch some of the uh, soil fertility lectures. Those links can be found on sunup.okstate.edu. In the fall of the year, of course, typically we wean the calves, and that's a good time to examine the cows as they uh, come through the chute to take a, a look to see which ones we're going to cull before we keep them throughout the course of the winter. It's obvious that we'll cull a lot of open cows, those that aren't pregnant, because they're not going to have a calf for us next year. No use putting that winter feed into those non-pregnant cows. But another key issue is age of the cows. And some producers may have some questions in their mind about uh, the uh, influence of age on the productivity of beef cows. There was a huge data set, came from Florida, clear back in the 80s, over a couple of years time. In, in one year, they had over 15,000 cows on this one ranching operation. The second year, over 19,000 cows. And they looked at the age of the cows and how that influenced their reproductive capabilities. What they found, and I think it's important for all of us to realize, is that on the average, these cows maintained reproductive uh, good status uh, out, out to eight years of age. After eight to 10 years of age, there was a slight, very slight drop off. After 10 years of age, then the drop off became more uh, of a decline, more steep, and finally, when they got to 12 years of age, then those cows really did have a dramatic difference, a dramatic decrease in their reproductive capabilities. So I think this gives us a little bit of a clue. As we're watching cows that go through the chute this fall, if we know the age of those cows by the number we put on their ear tag or just our, our own records, we probably want to start looking at these cows, especially at about 10 years of age. If there's something else wrong with those cows in terms of bad feet, bad eyes, bad teeth, perhaps they're a little low in body condition, then we may want to give some serious consideration to going ahead and culling them this fall or winter. Once we get to 12 years of age, then uh, certainly it's an individual decision on these cows, but I would be very, very, very cautious about keeping cows that are more than 12 years of age through the course of the winter because what we don't want to end up with is a cow that's very thin next spring and we have to go ahead and cull her after carrying her through the winter and we've got a cow that's lighter, lower in body condition that brings a lot less per pound and a lot less total dollars than she would if we had culled her this fall. So we hope this data will help you as you're looking at cows this fall as to which ones you're going to cull or keep so that we have the best set of cows going through the winter utilizing our winter feed dollars and we go ahead and market those that really need to be sent to be marketed on time for the best situation for the cows and for the ranch. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. As part of OSU's homecoming celebration this weekend, we caught up with the Cowboys star receiver to learn about his future plans in agriculture. One of the best wide receivers in college football and likely top NFL draft choice is country at heart from the small town of Stamford, Texas, north of Abilene. Uh, I, I love it, you know, because it, it's, it's not big, it's not a bunch of city life, which I understand some people have that in them, but not me. We met with James Washington after practice this week to talk not about football, but about his connection to agriculture. 
you know, I, I enjoy, you know, going out to farms and, and hunting and, and fishing with guys and, and just getting to be one with nature sometimes. It's pretty special, isn't it? It is. I enjoy every minute. James's dad has always worked on farms and ranches, and just this week they talked about challenges with the cotton crop. Well, here recently with the big rain, you know, uh, flooded a bunch of it, and it, it's not really growing, so it, it kind of got looked like it got root rot or something. But uh, I haven't deal with that, and so he'll miss this week's game, but uh, hopefully my mom makes it and my cousins. In the meantime, it's business as usual on campus. Ag business, that is. When he's not playing ball, James is a regular student, currently a senior in the Agricultural Economics Department at Oklahoma State. Rodney Jones is his academic advisor and professor of ag finance. James is, is there uh, very diligently. Every, uh, that class meets at 8 o'clock in the morning on Mondays and Wednesdays. Some students seem to struggle to make it to that class once in a while. James is not that kind of a student. James is there uh, every every Monday and Wednesday morning. And then we'll hit you again James is on track to graduate in the spring after deciding to return to play a fourth year for the Cowboys. I think it says a lot about his his uh, his character and and the importance that he places on the educational component of his college experience. James says OSU's reputation as a top agriculture school means a lot to him. Uh, growing up, I wanted a, a farm and ranch management degree, and uh, here they offered two ag business, and then with a minor in farm and ranch. So uh, that, that played a big part of my decision of coming here. And you know, from freshman year until now, I enjoy every minute of it with uh, you know the professors and, and the ag department there. They're all willing to help as much as they can, and I really enjoy them. You know, James wants to be involved in agriculture. He, he wants to be a, a, a manager, owner, manager of a farm or ranch at some point in his career. And no doubt Professor Jones will cheer him on then, just like he does now. You should see me in the stands when, when I, we're there with a group of people and, and uh, you know, James makes a good play. Yeah, it's, that, that's my advisee. I know that guy. <laughs> Well, it's finally fall and people are out hunting for whitetail deer and at least for land owners and managers that are interested in harvesting large antler deer a question that always comes up is should I cull inferior antlered bucks to have larger antlered bucks and in a free-ranging whitetail deer population that is deer that are not enclosed that can move about across the landscape the answer is no, there is no benefit to you to cull what you think are inferior antlered bucks. Research has clearly shown that you can have no influence on this at a landscape level. And there's several reasons why that is. The first is that often we make mistakes in judging what is inferior. Deer often have an injury during that summer and they'll have an, uh, an antler deformity um, and that will make a hunter think that the deer is inferior when in fact it's just an injury. Also during drought years or when deer have poor nutrition, antler size can be much less uh, than what that deer's genetic potential is. Uh, often hunters want to cull spike bucks, but spikes are typically deer that were just born late the previous year and, and they could have tremendous genetic potential for large antlers. And finally, does are contributing 50% of the genetic material that controls antler development. And you cannot look at a doe and tell what kind of genetic material she's passing on for antler development. So when you put all this together, what it means is you really cannot control genetics in a free-ranging white-tailed deer herd. So if you want to control antler size, there are two things that you can influence, and that is provide a lot of nutrition throughout the whole calendar year, and then also delaying harvesting of bucks until they're at least four or five years old because most bucks will not reach their antler potential until somewhere between five and seven years old. So focus on nutrition and age of the deer and don't worry about the genetics in a free ranging whitetail herd.
finally today, the fun and fascination of the corn maze and its contribution to Oklahoma ag tourism. We're here in Hydro, Oklahoma at Pubar Farms. We share our farm with uh, thousands of people each year with agritainment. We have pumpkin patch, petting zoo, um, laser tag, haunted maze, all of those things, and everybody's got a different favorite. We've been riding the tractor ride, and now we're here uh, waiting for the other people to get back so we can ride the train ride. Before doing this, we were wheat, peanut, and cattle. And we started the corn maze in 2001. Uh, really didn't know, I thought, I, I was hoping for uh, a thousand people, and we ended up having somewhere close to five to 6,000 the first year. And uh, by year three, it was continuing to grow, and my father-in-law and I just saw the need that it was time to kind of shut down the family farm as far as conventional farming and take new direction into agritourism. Agritourism provides farmers and ranchers uh, primarily a, another source of income, so it's a way of diversifying income. Uh, but it also has a secondary benefit of providing um, education opportunities, again, for people who uh, either didn't grow up on farms or have lost that farm connection. So it's really just an alternate strategy, much like second crops and uh, the winter grazing and those kind of activities are um, to the farmer. I think any farmer that has a passion for sharing his farm uh, would be excited about this career. I mean, just being able to, uh, to teach kids about where our food comes from. We're raising that, again, first generation of kids that have no idea where their food comes from. It's a growing industry. It's larger than, than most people think. I mean, it consumes uh, everything from wineries to strawberry patches to blackberry patches, Christmas tree farms. Uh, dairies that actually share their dairies for you know so it's huge and there's a great potential to, to be able to educate again these kids and share with them your farming experience that'll do it for us this week remember you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on youtube and social media i'm lyndall stout have a great week everyone and remember oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup